In this episode of Epic Solo, we're going to cover encounters and combat for old school essentials. Let's head on down to the virtual battle grid. There's an ogre. Got some goblins. There's an ogre. Got some goblins. There's some heroes. Got some problems. I'm just going to keep jamming. <laughs> Welcome to the program. We're going to do a combat tutorial. We're going to do an encounter tutorial. And everything that we're going to do can be found if you open your player's tomb to page whatever. It's in there. But you don't even need the player's tomb. You can actually go to necroticgnome.com and get the completely free basic rules for old school essentials. Everything that we're going to do is covered in that PDF. So go download it and come back, or don't, because everything you need to know is going to be pretty much right here on the screen. Let's get started. All right. Now I know what you're thinking. You want to see this ogre smash these adventurers. So do I. <laughs> but before a combat scenario develops, we must first resolve an encounter. An encounter begins when the characters stumble onto a monster, either because the referee has planned an encounter in the area the player characters are exploring, or because a random die roll indicates an encounter. So there are five steps to the encounter sequence. One, surprise. Two, determining the encounter distance. Three, rolling initiative. Four, actions. And five, the conclusion. So let's start with step one, determining surprise when to check so a check for surprise is made for any side that is not expecting the encounter for example if a monster is waiting quietly for an approaching party that is making a lot of noise the monster would not have a chance to be surprised but the party would to determine surprise checks each side that is not already aware of the other's presence rolls 1d6 the referee is going to roll for the monsters and then one player is gonna roll for the adventuring party as a whole. On a result of a one or a two, that side is going to be surprised. All right, so now we're gonna roll for surprise. The monsters are gonna be the red dice and the player characters are gonna be the white dice. Again, we're looking for a result of one or two. That's gonna mean that the side is surprised. And based on the results, we'll talk about the effects next. So here we go. All right, so no ones or twos, that means neither side is surprised. Now, if both sides are surprised, there's simply a momentary confusion. Neither side has any advantage. But if one side is surprised, bad news. That side that is not surprised is going to gain a one-round advantage. The surprise side cannot act that round. So neither side is surprised. That means we're going to move on to step two, determining the encounter distance. So in determining the encounter distance, the situation in which the encounter occurs often determines how far away the monster is. If there is uncertainty, the encounter distance may be determined randomly. Now I get asked questions about this quite a bit. It's something that I don't use very often. If it's a, a random encounter, I'm much more apt to use it. But if it's a key dungeon and it's a monster in a location, again, the key text here is if there is uncertainty. And most of the time I'm pretty certain where the monsters are located. Even on a random encounter, there's some logistic things within your dungeon. If you're playing with miniatures, that, that makes sense. But this is a great means by which you can determine the encounter distance uh, if there is uncertainty. All right, that's gonna bring us to step three, roll for initiative. That's right, it's monster fighting time. <laughs> That's what you came for, right? <laughs> so we're talking about group initiative and we're also talking about rolling initiative 
at the beginning of each new round. All right, so pretty straightforward stuff here. We're going to roll 1d6 for each side. And uh, the monsters, again, are going to be red. And the player characters are going to be white. The winner is going to be the side with the highest roll. They're going to act first. The other sides act in order from highest to lowest roll. Now, ties, either both sides may roll again, which is what we do just because I like Chuck and Dice, or actions on both sides may be resolved simultaneously. Red is the monsters. White is the player characters. Those gross nerds, the player characters, are going to go first. All right, I'm going to be honest. I'm kind of rooting for the monsters tonight, and I know you are too, and it's nothing personal. It's, it's nothing against Cassius, Gonzar, and Pendor down there. It's just that ogre is mean, and, and he's going to start swinging that club, and it's going to get brutal real quick. And, and if you get a bad roll, remember, one of the awesome things about Old School Essentials, you're going to get a chance to re-roll at the top of the round. Now, one of the things about advanced fantasy for old school essentials, if you want to do individual initiative, you go right ahead. Uh, we're going to keep it core and we're going to use group initiative. And so the players are indeed going to get to act first because they rolled higher with a six to the monsters four. So that's going to bring us to step four of the encounter sequence, which is actions. Any sides that are not surprised decide how they will respond to the encounter. The encounter is played out accordingly. Now, for monster actions, they're determined by the referee, and they're pretty much the same as the player character actions, which are combat, evasion, and parlay. Let's talk about the least exciting action, evasion. That might not be very exciting or heroic, but it might save your life. If one side wishes to avoid an encounter, it may attempt to flee. This is called evasion, and it is only possible before combat has begun. Now, when a side decides... To attempt an evasion, the opposing side must decide whether or not to pursue. If the opposing side decides to let the other side flee, then the evasion automatically succeeds, the encounter is avoided. But if the opposing side gives chase, the chance of the evasion succeeding depends on the environment being explored. So the evasion and pursuit section of the player's tome is going to have that information. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this tutorial, and so know that it is an action and that it is something that can happen to avoid combat, or worse, in the encounter sequence. Let's talk about the parlay action. So the parlay means that a player character may attempt to communicate with monsters. Opening an encounter in this way can influence the monster's behavior. So I think the best way to summarize the parlay action, which often leads into the monster reaction role, is going to be, I'm going to quote John N. McGowan, who's somebody I recently followed on Twitter because of this extremely profound quote in which John says, reaction roles are just probability-based improv prompts. Boom! John nails it. That is precisely what is happening here. And, and that spirit of improv, that spirit of, of not knowing what direction things are going to go is very much at the heart of old school D&D. &D. And so... Prepare, don't plan. Allow yourself to be surprised. That's one of the things I love most about monster reaction roles. I, as the referee, I don't always know how the monsters are going to react. I don't always know what monsters are going to be there if I'm rolling on a, a random encounter table. And so this gives me a, a tool. It provides me a toolkit to create some of the most amazing, hilarious, awesome, game-changing events that I've ever experienced don't be afraid of the monster reaction role and allow your players to use the parlay action. One more thing worth mentioning. You probably want to send your highest charisma character to the front of the party to do to perform the parlay. For example, the half-elven sorcerer Malifak. He's a very good candidate because he has high charisma and he wants to talk to the monsters. And so you're going to get a bonus if you're looking for a more favorable role from the monsters, send your high charisma player character to perform the parlay. All right, so that's going to bring us to the final action, the main attraction, combat. That's right. You guys are bloodthirsty. You came to see that ogre swing that club, and I'm here for it. Here we go. So the combat sequence per round is as follows. Step one, declare spells 
and melee movement. Number two, initiative. We've already performed that as part of the encounter step. We're going to use that for this round, but at the top of next round, we're going to roll again. Number three, the winning side acts, and we're going to act in this order. Monster morale, if applicable, movement, missile attacks, spell casting, and then finally melee attacks. And then number four, the other side is going to get a chance to act or other sides in initiative order. Something that helps me is a little mnemonics here. And so chant with me because it never changes. Ready? Morale, movement, missile, spell, melee. M-M-M-S-M. Morale, movement, missile, spell, melee. That is the order. Once you get that down, combat is a breeze. Step one, declare spells and melee movement. Players must inform the referee if they intend to cast a spell or move when in melee. Other actions need not be declared. I guarantee somebody watching this is going to go, oh, I get it. Melee movement very specifically refers to two types of movement if you are engaged in melee with a monster. Fighting withdrawal, where the combatant moves backwards at up to half their encounter movement rate, uh, they need to have a clear path for this movement. Or retreat, the combatant turns and flees from melee, moving at their full encounter movement rate. But what's going to happen is opponents are going to get plus two bonus to all attacks against the retreat and combatant, and it's going to ignore any AC bonus due to the retreating combatant shield. And so that's why they want you to declare if you're going to be disengaging, if you will, a withdrawal or a retreat. They want you to do that in step one if you are in melee. That's why they say melee movement. So our dwarven cleric Gonzar is going to declare a spell as part of step one. We're not going to actually cast the spell until step three when we act, but we need to declare that we're casting now. So I'm going to declare that Gonzar is going to cast protection from evil. So that's going to bring us to initiative. Now we've already rolled for initiative in the encounter phase. I'm going to use that order. And again, when you're taking an action in the encounter phase, you're typically not going to say, or I'm, I want to engage in combat. You know, <laughs> your fighter might say, I'm going to, uh, stab that ogre in the face with my sword or you know i'm going to cast magic missile and so a hostile action towards the opposing side would initiate combat now again we've already rolled for initiative and so we're done but we're going to roll again at the top of next round so the winning side is going to act first and right now that's the player characters and again remember mmm sm morale movement missile spell melee monster morale is a great optional rule that I like to use. How monster morale works is that each monster is gonna have a morale rating. And at this point in step three, we can make morale checks. Now, most often how it happens, the referee is gonna roll 2d6 and it's gonna compare the result against the monster's morale score. Higher than the morale score, the monsters will surrender or attempt to flee. And if it's equal to or lower, the monster will continue to fight. If there's two successes, a monster makes two successful morale checks in an encounter, it will fight until killed. No further checks are necessary. Now, when to check for morale? We're not going to check for it in round one. You never check for it in round, round one. I guess you could if you really wanted to, but here are the rules. The referee usually makes a morale check for monsters under two conditions. First death on side. So the first time one of their number is killed in battle, they're going to make a morale check or the side is half incapacitated. When half the monsters have been killed or otherwise incapacitated, make a morale check. So once one of those conditions is triggered, this would be the point, uh, the first sub step of step three, checking monster morale when you would perform that role. That's going to bring us to step 3B, which is movement. Now, all three of our player characters are outside of melee, which means that they can move up to their encounter movement rate each round. Maximum duration. Combatants may move at this rate for at most 60 rounds. That's a lot of rounds. I don't think we're going to see 60 rounds here. One of our player characters may not move because they are casting a spell. So because Gonzar is casting a spell, it is his sole action and there is no movement. Pandor is eligible to move, but he will not. Cassius, on the other hand, will move. So he's going to move to attack the goblin. Now, he is wearing full plate. Do a little quiz here. What is his maximum movement rate? Did you say 20 feet? Well, then you are correct. He's going to get 20 feet 
to move. Something worth noting here too is I, I see this mistake happen a lot. You don't have to declare your movement uh, in step one. Uh, it says very specifically other actions need not be declared. So in this instance, you can wait until this moment. If you choose to move, this is the time. And so you declare, hey, I'm going to run up uh, with my sword and, and attack that goblin. So with Cassius in place here, our movement is done. That's going to bring us to step 3C, missile attacks. So our halfling thief Pandor is going to make a missile attack with his short bow. And that's possible because he is more than five feet away from his target. And so range modifiers come into play here. All missile weapons have ranges noted in the equipment list. Short range, medium range, long range, and beyond. They're going to get bonuses or the attack's going to be possible or not possible based on your missile weapons range. Now, if we're within 50 feet, that means we're within short range. We're going to get a plus one bonus to the attack roll. Now, the target is going to be that goblin on the right, and that target is not behind cover. So without further ado, let's let some arrows loose. Here we go. So for this tutorial, we're going to be using Ascending Armor Class. If you look in the upper left corner, uh, Pandor's mini character sheet, you're going to see his attack bonus for a third level thief is zero. But he does have a plus three bonus because of his dexterity modifier. He's also going to be getting a plus one because he's in short range with the short bow. So a total of plus four, and he's trying to hit that goblin with an armor class of 13. So let's go ahead and roll. So 15 plus three plus one is 19. That's going to hit armor class 13. All right, now that we've already done it, let's actually talk about the steps of the attack roll. There's four steps. We're using ascending armor class. Step one is to roll a 1d20. We did, and we got a 15. Step two is to apply modifier, strength for melee, dexterity for range. Then you're adding any range and or cover bonuses or penalties. We added our plus three for our dexterity and a plus one for being in short range for a total of 19. Step three is to determine hit armor class. Add the attacker's attack bonus. The result is the ascending armor class score of the attack hits. Our total bonus was 19. So we hit armor class 19. Step four, the result. So if the hit ascending armor class is equal to or higher than the opponent's AAC, in which it is, the attack hits. The goblin's armor class is 13. We rolled to hit armor class 19. That is a hit. Now the last sentence, the referee rolls for damage. What? No, they don't. If you want to have the referee roll everything behind the DM screen, go right ahead. We like to chuck dice. And so players roll for damage. We're going to be doing that next. Rolling for damage. So when the PC attacks, you inflict 1d6 damage. Damage of melee attacks is modified by strength. We use the variable weapon damage optional rule. And so different weapons are going to do different damage. In this case, it's a wash because we're using a short bow, which is 1d6. Now when monsters attack, we deal the damage indicated in the monster's description. Minimum damage. An attack which hits always deals at least one point of damage, even when damage modifiers reduce the number rolled to zero or less. My favorite rule, death. A character or monster reduced to zero hit points or less is killed. Taking a look at our goblin monster stat block here, not a lot of hit points. They've got three hit points. And so if we roll more than three damage, that's going to be one dead goblin. So five damage is going to do it. That is enough to reduce the goblin's hit points to zero. And the goblin is dead. Which begs the question, if it happens to monsters, why shouldn't it happen to player characters, right? <laughs> so zero hit points and that goblin is no more. So that'll do it for missile attacks. We're gonna move on to step 3D, which is spell casting. Now in step one, Gonzar declared he was going to cast protection from evil. Let's take a look at the spell casting rules. Freedom. The spellcaster must be able to speak and move their hands. A spellcaster cannot cast spells if gagged, bound, or in an area of magical silence. Soul action. When casting a spell, no other actions may be taken in the round. No movement. The spellcaster cannot move and cast a spell in the same round. Line of sight. Unless noted in a spell's description, the intended target, a specific monster character or area of effect, must be visible to the caster. Disrupting spells. This is why this is such an edgy, wonderful 
system in that you're declaring spells, but there's a real good chance, depending on how the initiative shakes out, you could get your spell disrupted. That's why there's not really concentration checks or anything like that, because it's baked into the mechanics of the combat sequence. Now, if a spellcaster loses initiative and is successfully attacked or fails a saving throw before their turn, the spell being cast is disrupted and fails. It is removed from the caster's memory as if it had been cast. So good news for our Dwarven Cleric Gonzar. He won initiative, he was not attacked, and he did not fail a saving throw. And so he's going to cast his spell, Protection from Evil. So with Gonzar casting Protection from Evil, that's gonna do it for step 3D. We're gonna move on to the final step, 3E, Melee Attacks. When it comes to melee attacks, there ain't nothing to it but to do it. And they're made possible when opponents are five feet or less from each other. Let's review the attack roll sequence. Four steps, we're gonna roll 1d20, we're gonna apply modifiers, we're gonna determine hit armor class, and then we're gonna look at the result to see if it hits and if we roll damage. Looking at Cassius's character sheet, we can see he has an attack bonus of zero. Uh, he has a strength bonus of plus one with his 15. And so that's it, he's gonna get the plus one bonus on his attack roll, so here we go. Now we're trying to hit the armor class of 13 for that goblin. And he's gonna miss. So Cassius moves into position to attack and he misses and that's gonna do it for step 3E. That's gonna bring us to step four, the other sides act in initiative order. Well, we only have one side. And so that's gonna bring us back to step three again and we're gonna repeat the same steps for the monsters. All right, time for a quiz. Let's see if you can remember the five sub-steps of step three where the sides act. Remember, a bunch of M's and one S. Three M's, an S, and another M. Did you get it? All right, we'll keep working on it. Here we go. Morale, movement, missile, spell, and melee. So I usually wouldn't make a morale check here. I know how I want this one to go down. It's a fight to the death, but we're gonna do it for the sake of the tutorial. And so, there has been an event that has triggered our morale check because the first death has occurred for the side of the monsters. And so we're going to roll 2d6 and we're going to compare the result against the monster's morale score. If it's higher, the monsters will surrender or attempt to flee. And if it's lower, they're going to continue to fight. So let's start with the goblins. So with a result of four, that means it's equal to or lower than the morale score of the goblins, which is nine. That means the monsters will continue to fight. If we get two successes, remember, during an encounter, they're gonna fight until killed. No further checks are necessary. So if we take a look at Grimsley the Ogre's morale score, it's a 10. I'm not even gonna bother rolling for it. The goblins passed. We're gonna say Grimsley's in the fight. He's a big, mean, club-swinging ogre, and he's not really afraid of these gross nerd adventurers. So use the context and the logic. Again, it's an optional rule, but I do use it and I use it most often when half of the monsters have been defeated. All right, step 3B movement. The goblins are gonna stay put, but Grimsley the ogre is gonna move to attack Cassius. So with movement done, we're gonna move on to step 3C, missile attacks of which there are none. Cassius engaged the goblin archer, so now that goblin archer becomes a melee attacker. In my games, I don't get too caught up on quick draw or things like that. The, if you have the weapon, you can use it. If you're holding a short bow, you can sheathe it in time to use your short sword and vice versa. So that's going to lead us to step 3D, spellcasting, of which there are no spells to cast. So you start to see combat starts moving pretty quick. Now I'm being long-winded trying to explain everything, but I hope you're getting a sense for just how awesome combat is in Old School Essentials. That's gonna lead us to step three E, melee attacks. So we definitely have some melee attacks incoming here against Cassius. Both the goblins and Grimsley are going to attack Cassius. Let's start with the goblins. There truly is something magical and rad about this rules light system, I love it. So we got some low level goblins coming in here. Attack bonus is zero and they're trying to attack Cassius, who's got an armor class of 16. Pretty simple stuff, they need to roll 16 or better. Let's roll for both the goblins, here we go. <laughs> you can't see it, I gotta pull it on screen here. They 
one of them's going to hit. Uh, it's it's a critical hit, meaning no extra damage or anything, but it will hit no matter what. So one of those goblins hits. Let's roll some damage. Short sword coming in at 1d6 for three damage. All right, so Cassius is going to take three damage, putting him at 11 hit points of 23. <gasps> Why only 11? Because he came into this battle injured from the last episode of Epic Solo, which if you're not watching it, why not? Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, check it out. Anyways, back to the tutorial. So not looking good for Cassius because he's about to get attacked by Grimsley. So it's Grimsley the Ogre's turn to attack. He's coming with a plus four, swinging with the big club. That's going to hurt. Grimsley's swinging the big stick here for D10. Here we go. Ouch. Not looking good. That's a nine. So Cassius takes nine damage, putting him to two hit points from the mighty swing of the Club of Grimsley. And so not looking good, but we're going to start round two. That means we're back to step one, where we declare spells and melee movement. Then we're going to roll initiative. And then we're going to do all the fun things of step three. Remember what it is? Morale, movement, missile, spell, melee. And then... We're going to do the same thing for the losing side, and then we're going to repeat it all over again until one side is victorious. So the beginning of round two, we're going to declare spells and melee movement. Now, as much as Gonzar would like to declare Cure Light Wounds and use it on his companion Cassius, that ain't going to happen because you cannot move and cast a spell in the same round. And so he's going to have to move and get up into the fray. We're just going to have to hope Cassius survives. Now, I am in melee, and I could elect to retreat with Cassius, but that would be kind of lame. And so <laughs> it's a fight to the death. But if it wasn't a tutorial, I think he would think about getting the heck out of there. But we're going to keep him in the fray. We're going to roll the dice and see what happens. So no spells or melee movement. That's going to move us to step two. Roll for initiative. Monsters of the red dice, players of the white. Here we go. This is, this is a big roll. Oh, they got a chance. Players act first. All right, so we're going to move to step three where the players are going to act. There's no 3A monster morale check. We're going to move right to 3B. Gonzar is going to move to attack Grimsley. He's going to try to get right next to Cassius and get into the fray. Now, Pandor is going to move to get a shot at Grimsley with his shortbow. He's going to be trying to set up the backstab. So in my games, here's how I handle backstab. Let's read the rule. When attacking an unaware opponent from behind... A thief receives a plus four bonus to hit and doubles any damage. I love it. It's very open to interpretation. And so you don't have to be hidden all the time. You don't have to be, you know, in the dark. As long as you are attacking from behind and the opponent is unaware, you're going to get the backstab. So let's use some context. So in this situation, if Grimsley the Ogre is in a melee with two capable fighters, he's probably not going to be aware that there's a halfling that has positioned himself behind the ogre, shooting an arrow at the back of his head. Therefore, backstab goes off. There's a lot of interpretations of this. That might be a liberal interpretation for some people, but that's the way I like to roll. What this creates is a very exciting opportunity in an adventure for the thief player to describe what they're attempting to do using the environment, using their imagination, being creative to describe how they're going to attempt this backstab. And if they can do it within the context of the scenario, absolutely, it's going off. So let's see if we can make it happen. So I just realized Gonzar does not have enough movement to get to Grimsley to attack. He only has 20 feet because he's wearing heavy armor, full plate. So he's going to try to get next to Cassius and attack that goblin, maybe get a heal next round. Now, Pendor, he's going to run down the room and try to get into position to get a backstab shot off on Grimsley the Ogre. So here we go. So we're going to move on to step 3C, missile attacks. And Pendor is going to attack Grimsley with the short bow. He's going to get the backstab because the opponent is unaware and it is from behind. So here we go. So one of the reasons I'm going to give him the backstab on this too is he is very close. If he was well outside of uh, short range, for example, even 25 feet away, then it starts to get a little dicey, but he's very close. And so this is house ruled differently at different tables, but he's absolutely going to get it here. 
And so that means we have 17 plus three for the dexterity, plus one for the range, plus four for the backstab for 25. That's going to hit Grimsley's armor class of 14 for sure. Let's roll some damage. So because of the backstab, we're going to get double damage for whatever we roll. So let's roll high. Here we go. We'll take it. That's eight damage. So Grimsley takes an arrow in the back of the neck for eight damage. That's going to put him down to 11 hit points and 19. So nice job by Pendor. We got a chance. We don't have any spells to cast for 3D. So we're going to move on to 3E and melee attacks. So that attack by Pendor was a game changer. And so Cassius is going to turn to face Grimsley the Ogre and take a stab with his longsword. So Cassius has an attack bonus of plus one, and we need to hit armor class 14. So we need at least a 13 here. Here we go. He doesn't get it. That's an eight, so he misses. So Gonzar is going to attack the goblin. Now here's the dirty little secret of this party. Gonzar is the real muscle, okay? He's coming in with a plus three. And it's a critical hit. I'm telling you, this character is something special. Gonzar the Dwarven Cleric. Get your sorceries ready. You'll need them this day. All right, now I'm pumped. Here we go. So Gonzar's swinging the Warhammer one-handed. He does have a shield. His surname is Hammer Shield, and so it's quite apropos. But here we go. We're going to swing with the hammer for 1d6. Let's see if we can get it done. Critical hit, but we still got to do the damage. That's going to do it. So with three hit points, four damage is going to be enough. And that is one dead goblin. And that is the end of melee. So that'll bring us to step four. And now the other side is going to act. And again, it is morale, movement, missile, spells, and melee. Here we go. So now the monsters are going to act. And we are going to do a monster morale check for the goblin. Because half of the monsters have been defeated. And so again, if it is higher than nine... That little goblin's going to flee. But if we succeed, no further checks are required. So here we go. Wow. And it's a nine. And so again, equal to or less than, they are not going to flee and no further checks are needed for the remainder of the encounter. So step 3B, movement, there is none. Step 3C, missile attacks, there are none. Step 3D, spell casting, there is none. And that's going to get us right to melee attacks. And Grimsley is going to attack Cassius. Let's see. This could be it. All right, Grimsley with the attack bonus of four, trying to hit armor class 16. And he does. Youch. So with Cassius sitting on two hit points, that's probably going to do it, but not 100%. So let's roll the dice. Really only a 10% chance that he lives. Here we go. <laughs> oh, he does. He lives. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, that's why you roll the dice. Awesome. Here we go. He's not out of the dungeon yet because that goblin is also going to attack. So here we go. No attack bonus for the goblin. And he does have to hit armor class 16. So let's see. Here we go. And that's going to miss. So he lives. Cassius lives. All right. So the start of round three. Cassius is at one hit point. Gonzar is going to declare that he's going to cast Cure Light Wounds on Cassius. There's no melee movement. All right, now step two, roll for initiative. Now, if you've been following along, tell me how awesome is it to roll initiative at the beginning of each round? It doesn't matter what version of D&D I play, that's how we do it. It's engaging, it's exciting. Gone are the days of metagaming. What's gonna happen on each turn as you're, you know, you've got a pretty good idea what's gonna happen. Not in this game. You really don't know who's gonna strike first and I love it. So here we go. Monsters are red, players are white. And there you have it. So the players have a chance. Cassius has a chance to live. Now, if the monsters win that initiative roll, it's probably curtains, but it's not. So here we go. All right. So 3A, no more monster morale checks. 3B, no movement. 3C, we do have a missile attack. I'm not going to give Pendor the backstab because he got it last round. And the reasoning behind that is now Grimsley's aware. All right. He got his one backstab off, but now the ogre's like, there's something back there shooting at me. And so he is aware if Pendor wanted to try to get a backstab, he'd have to get pretty creative, but not in this circumstance. So it's just going to be a regular attack at plus four. 
after Dexterity and Range modifier. So plus four, need to hit Armor Class 14. 18's going to do it. That's a 22. Grimsley's sitting at 11 hit points. Let's see what we can do here. Two. We'll take it. Down to nine. So we're going to move on to 3D spellcasting, and Gonzar is going to cast Cure Light Wounds on Cassius. Two plus one, three hit points. We'll take it. So Cassius is back up to four hit points, and that's important because it could be the difference between life or death. Now, I've been making a mistake. Did you catch it? It's okay. And I'm glad I made a mistake because I don't want the tutorial to be perfect because mistakes are part of the game and you got to roll with it. But here's the mistake I made. I've been giving Cassius a plus one bonus. That's incorrect. He should get a plus one plus one bonus because he has a plus one from strength and a plus one from weapon specialization. That's right. I play with the optional weapon proficiency rules and Cassius has specialized by putting two slots of his weapon proficiency in longsword. And so, yes, so Cassius actually gets a plus two to his attack rolls, plus one from strength, plus one from weapon specialization. So here we go. Cassius is going to try to attack Grimsley. He's looking to hit armor class 14, and he's got a plus two bonus. 16 plus two is 18. That's going to hit. So Cassius finally gets a hit. So rolling for damage, he's got the long sword. He's got the plus one for the strength and the plus one for specialization. And so he could do it. Grimsley's sitting at nine points. He would need at least a seven. Let's see if he can do it. Not quite five damage, but Grimsley is wounded. That'll bring us to step four and then back up to three where the monsters get a turn to act. Grimsley's sitting at four hit points. Let's see what happens. So no monster morale check, no movement, no missile attacks, no spell casting. That'll bring us right to melee attacks. And now Grimsley is going to attack Cassius. And here's where we're at. We're at the point where every blow could be deadly. So let's see what happens. Again, he's rolling at plus four, trying to hit armor class 16. 16 plus four is 20. That's gonna hit armor class 16, but will it be enough damage? Let's find out. Cassius is currently at four hit points. And that's all it took. We already talked about the zero hit point rule, so that means Cassius is the dead. And that goblin is now going to attack Gonzar. All right, goblin's going to attack Gonzar. No attack bonus. Needs to hit 18. <laughs> and a valiant effort, but not good enough. That's going to bring us to the start of round four. And so we're going to declare spells and melee movement, of which there are none. Now we're going to roll for initiative. Red is the monsters, white is the players. And for the fourth time, the players get initiative. Players act. Step three. There is no monster morale check. There is no movement. There is a missile attack. Pendor is going to attack. Grimsley the Ogre. So he's going to notch up another arrow and let one loose. A combined bonus of plus four needs a 14 to hit. And a 19 is going to do it. So the arrow hits its mark. Smack dab right in the back of the head. He needs four damage. And he gets it. He gets exactly what he needs. So Pendor, the mighty Ogre Slayer, gets the killing blow on Grimsley. Let's see if uh, Gonzar can finish off this last goblin. Gonzar is attacking with a plus three bonus to hit. He needs to hit armor class 13. 13 plus three is 16. That's a hit. So Gonzar, with his plus three strength bonus, is all but guaranteed to destroy this goblin and send him back to his maker, Grimshaw, which is the goblin deity in Orn Sphere. So here we go. That'll do it. Seven damage. What asked that then, isn't it? Sure is a shame about Cassius. Time to loot the corpses and see what kind of treasures they're holding. There's no treasure, you soft-brained halfling. And why is that? Because it's a tutorial. Oh, right. 